Hello, welcome to the course SJPHY1C01 Properties of Matter and Thermodynamics. The contents of today's lecture is taken from Properties of Matter by JC Ubadhyaya. We will continue to discuss topics from Module 2 Surface Tension and Viscosity. In the previous class, we learned the derivation of Poiseuille's equation. Today, let's see how to experimentally measure the viscosity of a fluid using Poiseuille's equation. So, experimental setup is shown in the figure. You have a capillary tube with uniform radius R and length L, which is fitted horizontally with a rubber bung at each end. And on either end, it's connected to two wide brass tubes B and C. And on one side, the capillary tube is connected to an outflow tube D through the brass tube C. And on the other end, the capillary tube is connected to a water vessel A through B and a rubber tube. The pressure difference between the ends of the capillary tube is recorded by noting the difference in height between the water columns in the two limbs E and F. Vessel A in which tap water is coming is fitted with an overflow tube O so that constant water level is maintained in the system. With the help of a pinch cock K, a steady water flow is maintained in the capillary tube such that water leaves the tube D in a slow trickle. Now water leaving D is collected in a measuring jar for a, a fixed time and from which water flowing through the tube per second, this is capital V, is determined. As I said, the pressure difference between the tubes can be calculated from the height difference between these two water columns because pressure P equal to H rho G. So once you know H, rho is the density of water and G is the acceleration due to gravity. Okay. Now from the Poiseuille's equation, you can write the coefficient of viscosity eta equal to 8 P r to the power 4 divided by 8 VL. So here all the parameters are known. P equal to H rho G which you can measure. R is the radius of the tube. Once again you can experimentally measure it using a microscope. And V is volume per unit time which you have measured using this measuring jar. And L is the length of the capillary tube. Okay. So from all these parameters you can calculate viscosity of the given fluid. Now you have to take certain precautions while performing this experiment. The pressure difference must be small enough to maintain streamlined flow, otherwise the flow becomes turbulent and the Poiseuille equation is not valid for a turbulent flow. Tube must be narrow to maintain streamlined flow. Tube must be long enough to even out non-uniformity in the flow. And finally, the tube must be placed horizontally to avoid any effect of gravity. Now there is another formula known as Stokes formula which connects the viscous force with a very important parameter that characterizes motion in a, in a viscous medium which is known as terminal velocity. When a body falls through a fluid, fluid could be a liquid or a gas, the layer of the fluid which is in direct contact with the body moves with the same velocity as the body. Okay. So the layer which is close to the body is moving, the layer next to that may not be moving. So you have a relative motion set up between the layers of the fluid. Okay. So as we know, uh, there is an inherent viscous force, a frictional force which is acting against this relative motion. Now let's see what are the various forces acting on the system. So body has a certain mass, so there is weight which is acting downwards. 
then there is the viscous force which uh, which is acting in the upward direction against the relative motion okay and when the body is falling down it's going to displace the water so the water is going to exert an an upward thrust on the board okay so these are the various forces you have weight acting downward viscous force acting upward and there is also an upward thrust at one point all these forces are going to balance each other so the total downward force due to the weight of the body is going to be balanced by the total upward force due to the viscous force plus upward thrust so at this point the net force on the body is going to be zero force f is equal to m into a when force is zero acceleration is zero which means the velocity of the body is going to be constant so this velocity is known as terminal velocity terminal velocity is an important parameter characterizing motion in a viscous medium for example if you look at uh, raindrops we know that when raindrops fall through atmosphere it is uh, it is acted upon by the gravitational pull of earth so we know the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meter per second square so in each second the velocity is going to increase by 9.8 right and water drops as we know travel a, a large distance in the atmosphere and in the each second the velocity is going to increase which means finally when the water drops reaches you which is the surface of earth its velocity should be very very high if gravity is the only force acting right so even though the mass of the raindrop is very very small if it travels with extreme high velocity it can hurt you but we all have experienced rain right we know that raindrops do not hurt us right its velocity is not that high now what's the reason so even though there is a gravitational force acting downwards since raindrops travel through atmosphere travels through air air is a viscous medium which means there is a viscous force which is acting in the opposite direction and this viscous force is going to reduce the velocity of the water drops and finally when it reaches you it had attained a terminal velocity which is much much lower compared to its initial velocity that's why it, it doesn't harm us now let's let's calculate what is the exact relationship between terminal velocity and the viscous force so let's take the case of a small sphere of radius a which moves through a homogeneous viscous fluid of infinite extension with terminal velocity v and the viscous force is going to depend on three parameters one coefficient of viscosity eta two radius of the sphere a three terminal velocity so i can write f is proportional to eta to the power a a to the power b v to the power c where a b c are unknown constant i need to find their values i can replace proportionality with a constant k which is a dimensionless parameter now i am going to follow the method of dimensions which we have done in the previous class so let's write the corresponding dimensions of each of these parameters force is uh, mass into acceleration which is kilogram meter per second square so its dimension is ml t to the power minus 2 coefficient of viscosity is kilogram per meter per second so ml minus 1 t minus 1 radius a its dimension is l and velocity is mass per time oh, sorry length per time so lt minus 1 okay. so this is going to be ml t minus 2 equal to m to the power a l to the power minus a plus b minus plus c and t to the power minus a minus c you know the drill now right compare the the powers of same parameters on either side so powers of m a equal to 1 powers of l minus a plus b plus c equal to 1 powers of t minus a minus c equal to minus 2 
So from the first equation, we get a equal to 1. Substitute in the second equation, you get c equal to 1. Substitute these two values in the second equation, you get b equal to 1. Okay. So f is equal to k eta a v. Now the, the specific value of k is 6 pi. So viscous force f is equal to 6 pi eta a v. This is known as Stokes formula. Now the downward weight of the body is going to be m into g where m is the mass of the body. You can write mass as a product of volume and density. So if a is the radius, volume of the sphere is 4 by 3 pi a cube. Rho is the density of the body. So this is the total downward weight of the body. And the upward thrust on the body due to the displaced fluid, once again this is uh, mass into gravity in the upward direction, mass of the fluid, so mass of the fluid is going to be density of the fluid sigma multiplied by volume of the fluid which is 4 by 3 pi a cube. So when the body attains terminal velocity, a total upward force due to upward thrust and viscous force is same as the total downward force due to gravity. So I can write 4 by 3 pi a cube sigma g plus 6 pi eta a v equal to 4 by 3 pi a cube rho g. So rearrange the terms 6 pi eta a v equal to 4 by 3 pi a cube rho minus sigma into g or the coefficient of viscosity eta equal to 2 by 9 a square g rho minus g by v where v is the terminal velocity. So this is the relation between terminal velocity and viscosity. Let's do a quick problem. An air bubble of radius 1 centimeter is, allows, is allowed to rise through a long cylindrical column of viscous fluid and travels at a steady rate of 0 0.21 centimeter per second. If density of the fluid is 1470 kilogram per meter cube, calculate viscosity of the fluid, like the density of air. So write down the equation, then write down all the parameters in SI unit. The radius A is 1 centimeter, which is 10 to the power minus 2 meters. Acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meter per second square. You are asked to neglect the density of air, so rho equal to 0. Density of the fluid sigma equal to 1470 kilogram per meter cube and terminal velocity v is 2.1 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter per second. So substitute all the parameters in the equation you get 152.4 pascal second. Okay. So you have to remember the unit correctly, the SI unit correctly. Now, so far we have been talking about viscosity of liquids. Now, gases being fluids, they also possess viscosity, but there is a slight difference between viscosity of gases and liquids. In the case of liquids, just like surface tension, viscosity is also going to decrease with temperature, whereas in the case of gases, viscosity is going to increase with temperature. Now we are not going to get into the details of the equation because uh, some of these equations are based on pure experimental observations and there are no strong theory behind this. Nevertheless, just get the idea that uh, the temperature dependence is completely different between liquids and gases. In the case of liquids, the layer which is in direct contact with the walls of the tube is stationary, but that's not the case with gases. And also for liquids flowing through a tube, volume of the liquid flowing through any cross section in a given time is a constant, but for gases, as we know, density varies with pressure, so volume is not a constant. Finally, uh, there is one more small concept related to liquids. This is known as Brownian motion. Now, if you take water in a, in a beaker and if you drop a tiny dirt particle on the surface of water and observe the particle using a microscope, you will notice that the dirt particle is, is moving. It's undergoing a random movement on the surface of the water. 
and the random motion of tiny particles suspended in a fluid due to their collision with the fast moving molecules of the fluid is called Brownian motion. The position of the particle randomly changes within the fluid subdomain. So if you take this entire figure as a domain of fluid, you can divide this into subdomain. And within each subdomain, you can see that the particle represented by uh, the yellow dot is going to uh, going to move uh, randomly. This is because of collision with the water molecules and the water molecules by themselves are randomly moving. Okay. So it moves in one subdomain uh, randomly, then it relocates to another subdomain and undergoes same random movement. Okay, so it's a domain based movement. And as you can see in this diagram, there is no preferential direction of flow. This is completely random because the collisions are uh, by default random in nature. So, since we are talking about random movement, when you look at the linear and angular momenta at a different time period, at different time points, they are in completely different directions. So, over a period of time, the total linear and angular momenta are going to be zero. And this motion was named after a botanist, Robert Bowne, who first described Brownian motion in the year 1827 while looking through the microscope at a pollen immersed in water. Now the first satisfactory theory about Brownian motion was given, by, given in the year 1905 by none other than Albert Einstein and he showed that the pollen is moved by collisions with the water molecules and later in the year 1908 Another scientist, Jean Perrin, experimentally proved this one. Okay. And this was uh, a huge breakthrough in the, in the history of physics and chemistry because this was the first conclusive evidence that atoms and molecules exist. Because now we have high resolution electron microscope, you can directly view an atom or molecule, but what we are talking about is uh, early 20th century and that time these kind of sophisticated instruments was not there and there were some theoretical predictions about the presence of atoms and molecules but nobody could prove it and Brownian motion was the, the first convincing evidence that atoms and molecules exist. So this was a huge boost for the atomic theory. Incidentally, if you look at this, this year 1905, this is a very, very significant year in the history of physics. Actually, this is known as Annus Mirabilis or roughly the miraculous year. Because in this year, four major discoveries were made, four seminal discoveries were made and these discoveries revolutionized physics. And the most surprising fact is that all the four discoveries were made by the same person, Albert Einstein. So the discoveries are the photoelectric effect, second one is a Brownian motion, then special theory of relativity, and finally the most famous one, mass energy equivalence, E equal to mc squared. And all these four revolutionized physics and all the four uh, discoveries made in the same year 1905. Incidentally, Einstein won Nobel Prize in the year 1922 for the theory of photoelectric effect. So with this, we come to the end of module 2, which also marks the end of our course uh, PHY1C01. So thank you. Goodbye.